if this had happened today, then those witnesses would have had cell phone videos. The likelihood is that those law officers would have had body worn camera video. It would have been all over the news. At the very least, the footage would have been made available. And there would have been no doubt in anyone's mind that these men killed Earl Faison. He's gathered, he's beaten, he's thrown in the back of a car, he's taken to Orange Police Department, he's pepper sprayed, he's brought to the medical examiner's office, and the medical examiner says he dies from asthma. Welcome to Official Ignorance, the Death in Custody podcast, hosted by Dr. Roger Mitchell Jr. and Professor Jay Aronson. You are now listening to the sounds of official ignorance. There's really only one place that this podcast can start, and that's Orange, New Jersey, the death in custody of a 27-year-old man named Earl Faison. It was April 1999. I was a first-year medical student, University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. I wanted to be a forensic pathologist. I, I wanted to study violence as a public health issue. I wanted to solve the ills of the world. 23 years old. It was on the heels of the killing of Amadou Diallo. He had just been killed in February of that same year. And then Earl Faison. Earl Faison. He wasn't much older than me, 27 years old. And he was killed too. A little bit differently, not shot multiple times by law enforcement like Amadou, but beaten, maced in his face. I would change my perspective forever. It was Earl Faison who would show me that these types of deaths could occur so close to home. And I just so distinctly remember in our earliest conversations, probably even that first conversation, that his death had a massive impact on you uh, and your memories of the circumstances surrounding his killing and the efforts of community members uh, to seek justice for him really motivates you to this day. Tell us how Faison's death and his life intersects with your own experience and why do you carry him with you every day in the work that you do? Jay, you know, the story is such that police officers received a call that a stocky, bald black man was was wearing a leather jacket and he was he had committed a robbery. And there was this officer, her name was Joyce Carnegie, and she was the first one on scene identifying this person that was to have been the person who committed this robbery. But then she was shot. She was found laying next to her patrol car. She had been shot in the belly. And she died from these wounds. And Carnegie, as you know, and as you've done your research, right? And I knew at the time, Carnegie was one of the first orange police officers to die in the line of duty for over 30 years. So quickly, this pursuit of a armed robber became now trying to find the killer of a, of a cop. And so over the next mm-hmm. couple of days, a group of volunteer law enforcement from not just Orange, but Newark, several other cities, were trying to find individuals that match the description. If you're a black man in this country, you understand Mm -hmm. when you, you match the description. Well, they were looking for someone that matched the description. And it was a particular officer that saw someone that may have matched the description. And here comes Earl Faison. He's 27 years old. He's pulled over and he runs away from law enforcement. Nobody really knows why he ran at the time, but it looks like he may have had a weapon on him. He may have uh, dropped that weapon, but he's found and caught three blocks later. And here comes the the altercation. There's an altercation with law enforcement. Officer David pepper sprays him in orders to subdue him. And then nine additional officers arrive. Let let me tell you, their witnesses, and this is before cell phone, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure, but this is before cell phone video. So 
these are witnesses that said, hey, you know, once they got a hold of him, he didn't try to flee. He didn't try to move. He was in custody. Well, mm-hmm. they also suggest that they immediately began to punch and kick him. And matter of fact, there's one witness that says that one of the officers took about a 20 plus foot run forward and kicked Earl Faison like he was kicking a soccer ball as far as he could. So now Earl Faison is beat and battered in the custody of law enforcement, and he's not transported to the hospital. He's transported to the precinct, Mm -hmm. and he's not afforded any medical assistance. He's again pepper sprayed in the nose and mouth while he's there, as the reports go, and he starts gagging and becoming labored and raspy gurgling and then mucus running down his nose. And then he becomes unresponsive. Mm -hmm. Law enforcement then decides to get him medical care and he dies. And the original autopsy, he's transported to the regional medical examiner office in Newark, New Jersey, which as a matter of fact, I used to work at, used to be the uh, chief medical examiner much years later because I was in med school, remember, in 1999 when all this is happening. And the medical examiner at the time calls it acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma while in police custody. Wait, 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 wait. Can you imagine? He's, he's, He's gathered, he's beaten, he's thrown in the back of a car, he's taken to Orange Police Department, he's pepper sprayed, he's brought to the medical examiner's office and the medical examiner says he dies from asthma. And then they call the manner of death undetermined rather than a homicide. That changed my life forever. And it was right then that I, you know, between Amadou Diallo and Earl Faison, I said, hey, I think police brutality, police violence is a public health issue. And and from there, um, I started moving in a different direction about how I thought about these these types of deaths. During that period, uh, one question that I always have w- with you and, and with others who are uh, in professions that, uh, th- that are directly engaged with issues of death in custody um, is how do you balance being a dispassionate professional with the kind of activist or advocacy uh, element of what you do. I mean, you you are very clearly a highly competent uh, uh, forensic pathologist, very well respected, um, but you're also an advocate. And and I think this this seems like a pivotal moment in your life where the the professional and the advocacy really kind of merge or they they both blossom at the same time. And, and I just wanted to know at that moment did you did you have that conscious realization that you were going down the path to advocacy or did it um did it kind of emerge over the next few months was it like a was it a like a spark or was it something that happened um over time no you know there's a distinction that we have to make jay you know as a physician i'm my patient's advocate mhm I- i've been trained i've been educated I've gone through everything that I need to go through to understand the biology of disease and injury, the pathology of disease and injury. And my job as a physician is to advocate for the proper care of my patient, right? So by definition, physicians are advocates. A cancer physician would be on breast cancer walks and raising money and wearing pink, right? and going on anti-smoking campaigns because they understand the the importance of not smoking when it comes to lung disease. So physicians are not new to advocating for their patient, not only their Mm -hmm. individual patient, but also their, their collective patient, the population, the community that's being affected by a disease or injury. So as a forensic pathologist, I just happen to see unnatural deaths. That is my area of expertise. I see a lot of natural deaths, but I see the majority, the reason why I exist as a forensic pathologist is to certify the cause and manner of death of non-natural deaths. Those are homicides, suicides, accidents, and undetermined. This is an example of these types of deaths that now I understand them 
And I want to make sure that people stop dying from similar situations that lead to these deaths. So I think that that is inherent. So when that became apparent, I've always been, I guess, a leader of sorts, mm -hmm. always trying to find out how I can help people. Um, and it was just this moment at this pivotal time in my life. I had just left the FBI. I had just learned about post-traumatic stress disorder and violence and, you know, the effects of environmental violence exposures to violence behavior. So there was a lot that I had learned coming out of undergrad, working at the FBI and now in medical school that culminated in that moment that sparked and said, what type of research can I do to understand police brutality, police violence, and what we could now call death in custody? That's so powerful. So part of the reason that I asked is that as a historian by training, I always want to find written documents that substantiate people's memories about the past when I can. The fact that a document doesn't exist doesn't mean that someone's memory isn't correct, but it's just something that I, that I find uh, it, it helps me um, provide evidence or to build a case uh, in, in favor of a particular view of the past. And when you find a document that substantiates your uh, intuition or what someone tells you, it can be really exciting. It's, it's yeah. kind of like scientific discovery. And I had one of those moments while I was doing research for this book. Um, and it's something that will always stick with me. And, and I know you know this, but um, at some point during the pandemic, I discovered a statement on what was at the time called police brutality. And it was issued by an organization called the Student National Medical Association. Uh, and, and the date on the statement was uh, 2019, um, so 20, 20 years after the death of Earl Faison. The statement focused on issues of over-policing in Black and other minority communities, um, and also the increased risk of police brutality and police killings in these communities. And it did more. It highlighted the traumatizing impact of police killings on families and on the entire community. And it did what you do, what you just did. Um, it framed police brutality and death in custody, not as something that might happen once in a while or that was the product of bad apples or of, uh, of rogue agents, but as something that was systemic. It was a systemic public health issue. It was very similar to the views that you have been expressing to me uh, over the past six years or so. So I was reading this thing and I was like, oh, people are finally catching up to Roger. And I was excited about it. I wanted to tell you about it. And I went back to the first page to find out who did this because I just happened to notice it and I was skimming through it. Uh, I get to the first page and it says, this is the third update of, the estate, uh, of a statement that was originally written in 2000. And who was it originally written by? Down at the bottom of the page, it says it was originally written by Roger Mitchell 22 years ago, or it was probably 21 years ago at the time. And it was a very poignant moment for me. Um, not that I needed it, not that, not that I didn't believe you, but it was a confirmation to me that this really was your life's work. <laughs> and and I, I think I felt privileged, or I know I felt privileged to be a part of this journey with you that you had started back in 1999 and, uh, and, and it really crystallized for you in, in 2000. And so um, I just wanted to share that both with you and also with our listeners. Yeah, Jay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tearing up here a little bit. Let me, let me just be very clear. Um, I'm a bit emotional uh, hearing you, uh, you know, tell that story because um, it is, has been my life's work to bring attention to this. You know, th it, this was when the community was grappling with the deaths of Amadou Diallo and, and, and others. Um, and I was looking for a way to apply what I learned at the Bureau and what I learned in med school and, 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 and apply it to the problem of police violence. And so um, I started going to meetings um, directed by the People's Organization for Progress. It's called POP there in Newark, New Jersey, ran by Mr. Larry Hamm, who is a phenomenal civil rights activist and leader in New Jersey. And uh, we were 
advocating and protesting police violence in community. And when I realized that police violence in community uh, was a public health issue, it was during that time. And I remember saying this for the first time. I was in a public rally and I was, you know, biting at the bit to stand on, on the steps in front of City Hall to give my explanation of what we needed to do. Um, and it was a very academic um, explanation. And I said, we need to treat police brutality as a health issue. That if you die because of people's actions, that's just as much as a health issue as cancer. And I was saying that in 1999. And it wasn't that it was a novel approach because injury prevention and control at the Centers for Disease Control was already a thing. David Satcher, who was the Surgeon General, had already put out a manifesto on youth violence called the Red Book years before that. And really, that's where I was pulling from. And I'd found David Satcher's book. I'd found that while I was at the FBI. And that's what prompted me to want to go to medical school. So I was pulling from and applying what was known principles of public health to police brutality. And I was a medical student. So shout out to the medical students that may listen to this and say, you know, what are the ideas that they're coming up with that no one may have ever thought of? Or people say that is a lofty thought. And it quite probably is because it's 20 something years later and I'm still talking about the need to categorize these deaths appropriately. So, yeah, I use that information, Jay, to develop that SNMA statement and, you know, shout out to the Student National Medical Association because we were student run, student led, and they wanted to do something. So although I'm listed as the original author, you can imagine how many people's hands were in that in 1999 to edit it and to make sure that it it went far enough but not too far that we balanced it that it was something that could you know um last the time that it needed to last so yeah jay this is my life's work and uh and it's really to understand how and why people die in the custody of the criminal legal system and what we can do to prevent it i think one of the other things that's valuable from Earl Faison's story is just like you're still doing this work 20 some years later, the family and community of Earl Faison is still seeking justice in his case. We obviously go into much greater detail in the book about the subsequent legal um, cases around his death and, uh, right. and the role of medical examiners and forensic pathologists in questioning that undetermined uh, designation for his death. And Although a few of the police officers did uh, ultimately get convicted and serve time for uh, the conspiracy to violate the human rights or the constitutional rights of, uh, of Earl Faison uh, and to try and prevent the legal system from finding out about it, nobody has ever been held accountable for his murder. And, and I know you might not want to make that claim, but um, this is a case where uh, he didn't need to die. He was not a threat to anyone. Uh, and I think we've seen in more recent cases, um, we've been more willing to impose some sense of culpability on police officers and others in the criminal legal system uh, when when they kill someone. Obviously, it's not always a homicide. It's, it's a homicide, but it's not always a murder. Um, in this case, it's pretty clear that he didn't need to die in this case. And so uh, Larry Ham, Pop, family members are still seeking justice. Uh, and I, th I think it's important to point that out, that this isn't something that, that happened and, oh, people move on 20, what it, we're more than 20 years on, and this case hasn't been resolved. It's important, Jay, to point out that if this had happened today, then cell phone videos would have been out on those witnesses, right? The likelihood is that those law officers would have had body-worn camera video, right? It would have been all over the news, at least at the very least, it, the footage would have been made available. And there would have been no doubt in anyone's mind that these men killed Earl Faison. And they killed him in a way that they didn't have to, that their lives were not at risk. Law enforcement is a peculiar institution in that it can resolve conflict 
by using deadly force. Matter of fact, we call law enforcement to resolve conflict that may escalate to the use of deadly force because we as common citizens are not allowed to make the choice to resolve conflict with deadly force. So they're allowed to use deadly force to resolve conflict. And so when they do, it needs to be in a way and place legally that it is supported that use of force, right? And so um, what I didn't talk about in the book or even in the a little bit in the SNMA statement is that after that, I did a lot of work on police stress management. We actually developed a whole police stress management um, research project that is published in the literature as well that talked about how to develop education and release mechanisms for police, that police can come off shift and talk about their issues during the shift and then leave. All police officers had access to a mental health hotline before they left. So what we mm -hmm. realized is that Police use of force is not just a structural racism issue, that it is this culture of not taking care of one's mental health in, in the force. And because if you were to suggest that you had a stress issue, depression, anxiety, then during that time, you would be degunned and placed on a desk. So even today's culture of law enforcement has that same cultural stigma surrounding mental health. And so what we realized then and what we realize now, the importance of looking at this through the lens of public health and that these, what may seem like criminal justice issues are not just criminal justice issues. These are public health issues that needs the mindset and the toolkit from everyone to think about these issues if we're going to solve them. And that has become even more clear to me um, at, through the work that you've done in preparing us for this podcast, but also the work you've done in the book. We lay out, you know, the myriad of approaches that non-law enforcement have taken to this issue. And we show that it's going to take so many more of us to solve this issue, but we need to know the clarity of the data and the clarity of the problem if we're going to get to it. This feels like a good place to tell our listeners a little bit more about who we are and what this podcast is about. I'm Jay Aronson, a historian and human rights scholar at Carnegie Mellon University. I've been engaged in investigations of human rights violations and war crimes around the world, and now I'm turning my attention to the criminal legal system in the United States. I don't need to get on an airplane to witness human rights violations. They're happening every day in my own backyard. And I'm Roger Mitchell, Jr. I'm a physician, a forensic pathologist, the former chief medical examiner of Washington, D.C., and now a professor of pathology at Howard University College of Medicine. I performed forensic autopsy examinations over my career and have been studying death and custody for over two decades. From Floyd to Thompson to Castile to McLean, I've uncovered different cause of death diagnosis than originally proffered. Now I share my perspective on the larger problem of death in custody. We've teamed up to expose the fact that despite having one of the best vital record systems in the world, we have no idea how many people die in law enforcement custody in the United States each year. This problem isn't accidental. Our lack of data about this issue is intentional and sanctioned at all levels of government. It's official ignorance produced by relying on the criminal legal system to police itself. But Jay, the problem isn't insurmountable. We just need to track these deaths like we would track all other deaths that we care about in the country. In other words, treat them as a matter of public health. You know, that checkbox that exists for women who have died during labor or during childbirth, that checkbox is how we know who's died under those circumstances. The way we know that cancer is associated with smoking is coming from our vital statistics and public health infrastructure. In this podcast, we provide concrete, achievable solutions and explain why it's so important to produce accurate statistics and conduct scientifically and medically robust investigation of death in custody. We recognize that 
the system we propose will require both professional and civilian oversight to function effectively. But the fact that the data will be available will allow for the public to study this problem even further. We often say the reason why we know how many women are dying in and around childbirth is because there's a checkbox on the U.S. standard death certificate. The reason why we know that there's, you know, cancer uh, associated with smoking is because there's a checkbox on the U.S. standard death certificate. So uh, I was just recently at a conference surrounding death certification. And your statement that the United States has the most sophisticated and reliable vital record system in the world is not overstated. It is truly a sophisticated, integrated way of tracking births and deaths in this country. And so we need to treat this matter as a public health issue. And so, like you said, we've teamed up, you know, uh, Jay Aronson, professor of human rights out of Carnegie Mellon and, and me, your favorite doctor from New Jersey, uh, who's a forensic pathologist here in Washington, D.C. We've come together to really talk about this arc, right? Over the next several episodes, we're going to explore the history of deaths in law enforcement custody in this country and the continuous efforts to document them by affected families and communities, as well as lawyers, investigative journalists, human rights advocates, and researchers from a variety of disciplines. We'll also explain how government agencies and officials seek to limit access or even cover up these deaths and why we can't rely on the same failed policies and practices to expose them to the world. Jay, this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to have a solution-oriented conversation about death in custody in a way that very few have even thought about. These series of conversations are going to scratch the surface of the content found in our book entitled Deaths in Custody, How America Ignores the Truth and What We Can Do About It. But don't forget, Jay, we have a bunch of bonus content. It goes into how we came into this work, the influence of hip-hop culture, to how we've approached this work, um, our relationship, our growing friendship over the last six years. Um, All of that bonus content is, is available to our listeners. But at the end of the day, we want people to think differently about death in custody. Think differently about how we can solve this problem. What people don't really realize, and we'll go into this deeper, Jay, but what people really don't realize is that death in custody is on a continuum. It's not just, you know, the George Floyds of of death in custody or the Amadou Diallo's or the Earl Faison's. You know, quite frankly, they're the LaShawn Thompson's. You know, they're individuals that may die on the floor of the jail because of lack of access to health care. There may be the Sandra Blands, right, that are that are hanging from, you know, inside the cell. And and it could be a series of people that are unnamed that we don't even know daily. You know why we don't know, Jay? You know why we don't know? We don't know because nobody's counting. Nobody's counting. And it's easy to count. So, so, you know, it's not about pointing fingers. Quite frankly, it's about our ability to say, hey, there's something going on here. How do we prevent it? How do we decrease the burden of disease or injury on a community? How do we save a little bit of money in healthcare delivery within our carceral system? You know, there's so many things that come out of being able to understand things from a public health standpoint. So if you can't tell, I'm excited, Jay. I'm excited I, ab- about it. I'm definitely excited about it. I'm, I'm proud of the work that we've done together. And, and I, want, I just wanted to reiterate that we, we want people to read our book. We want people to listen to this podcast. We want them to be enraged. We want them to be motivated to act and make a change. But in order for people to be motivated, we want them to be hopeful. Uh, I, I think one of the things that we do a great job of showing the resistance that community members and professionals and lawyers and scholars have put up to this official ignorance uh, and have really fought back against it. And I think we we build on their work. We stand on the shoulders of giants. We, we stand on the shoulders of giants, but we also stand on the shoulders of ordinary people who uh, have been doing this work for more than 100 years in the case of Ida B. Wells. 
Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out is that um, one of the things that I've learned both from, from hip hop uh, and, and from years in the human rights community is that the kind of work that we're doing, the kind of work that we're asking people to do, the advocacy that we're asking people to do, isn't possible without regular doses of love and joy and laughter. And so even though this is a really heavy topic and it can be incredibly depressing, we're going to do our best to provide a little bit of that here as well, to, to leaven the serious stuff uh, with, with some fun. Um, just because if you don't have that, then you can't keep going. Uh, it becomes overwhelming. Now, Jay, listen, man, I, I've enjoyed... Uh, our our friendship and the last six almost seven years of of work that we've done together and I always feel like you know we're just getting started so I'm looking forward to a great series but also all that's going to come from ha us being willing to have this conversation not only with each other but the ability to have the conversation with the guests that we're going to bring on um, and getting their thoughts and input, but also the conversation that we're going to have all across the country, helping people unpack this problem and engaging people so that we can develop solutions. So I'm, I'm excited to get started. Well, then let's get started. You are listening to Official Ignorance, the Death in Custody podcast. 